Welcome. We're going to continue talking about the history of Judaism today, and we're to the point where we're talking about how Judaism changes during the Axial Age. The Axial Age, of course, um, correlates with the Babylonian exile of the Jews after the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's where we stopped last time. We're going into exile. A lot of the Jews end up having good lives in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to destroy them. Very different than the Assyrians. See, when the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed. By the way, I mentioned this in the uh, Four Periods uh, video class, which is right after the Covenant video class. You really should watch them both. But when the Assyrians destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, they're merciless. They break up families and tribes. They want these people to forget who they are. They don't want them to retain any kind of you know ethnic pride or religious uh, pride that might somehow foment another rebellion. Um, and so these people do end up forgetting who they are. They never come back to their land. In fact, today, uh, those 10 northern tribes that were taken into captivity, uh, we call them the 10 lost tribes of Israel to this day. However, century and a half later, when the Judahites are taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, uh, they're much kinder. Um, they would have made a covenant if the Judahites would just cooperate it. But they're not trying to destroy them and make them forget who they are or, you know, uh, so uh, the Judahites, um, you know, once they're in Babylon, um, they can continue to believe whatever they want to believe religiously as long as they don't offend the gods of Babylon. Um, they can also continue to, uh, continue to practice their vocations. In fact, those who have vocations uh, that can be helpful for Nebuchadnezzar, he uses them, puts them to work. Nebuchadnezzar uses talent where he finds it. Uh, there is a book, a prophetic book written uh, during the Babylonian exile called the Book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel, and there are three other young men uh, mentioned in this story too, um, and the four of them are all young uh, Judahites that uh, have education and have been trained to be administrators. They're probably the sons of governors or whatever. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar puts them to work as administrators. Um, so again, um, by the time we get to the overthrow of Babylon, which is about a half a century later, a lot of these Jews have very good lives in Babylon. Now, the next thing I want you to think about, finally, before we get to the change here, <laughs> Persia's coming, is that 50 years, it means that the person in your household um, that remembers the land of Judah and remembers Solomon's temple and remembers, you know, Jerusalem before it was destroyed by the Babylonians is probably your grandfather. Uh, most working age men, think of a guy that's that's 40 or 45. Well, he was born five or 10 years into the Babylonian captivity. He's never seen Judah. And his kids, he can have kids that are 20 or 25 that have never seen Judah. It's grandpa that's seen Judah. So for at least two generations here, um, life in Babylon is all they've seen. Keep that in mind, and this will help to help you to understand why when they get the opportunity to go back to their land, a lot of Judahites elect to stay in Babylon. In fact, the majority of them do because they have lives there. Third generation lives in Babylon. And, uh, but thousands do go back. And when they come back, as we mentioned, we find out their religious ideas have changed an awful lot. So let's talk about why this might have happened. First of all, it is the kingdom of Persia being led by King Cyrus the Great that actually overthrows Babylon. And it is in the days of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, grandson. If you read the biblical story, it's kind of ambiguous, makes it sound like it's Nebuchadnezzar's son. Uh, but we know historically it's actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson that was ruling when the uh, Persians overthrew the Babylonian Empire. By the way, just like Babylon is today Iraq, what's Persia today? You should know this from studying Hinduism and the Aryans. Persia is Iran uh, today. Anyway, King Cyrus the Great is a great king. And uh, for many reasons, not just military strategy. And the Jews love him because when King Cyrus overthrows the Babylonians, the first year of his reign, he issues a decree that any of the Judahites that wish can go back to their land and rebuild their land, rebuild their temple, rebuild their cities. They'll be a vassal kingdom of Persia, uh, but that's sounding pretty good now. And um, so a lot of them will go back and, uh, and will build up their land. And so this is what we're going to talk about now, because when they come back, uh, they're very, very different. Their religion is very different. So let's talk about some of the changes uh, that start happening. 
So when I say Persian Zoroastrian influence, what are we talking about? Well, in Persia, as we mentioned when we talked about uh, the different theisms and so on, uh, Zoroastrianism, or uh, it's actually founded by a guy named Zarathustra, uh, but translated into another language, it's pronounced Zoroaster, so it's called Zoroastrianism, and this is the earliest form of monotheism. Now, it's not exactly the same as classical monotheism today, and um, Zoroastrianism over the centuries does kind of change and become something other than, you know, uh, orthodox monotheism, but it starts out believing there's one God, and there's some kind of a nemesis against God, a Satan, if you will, they call Ayrman or Angramanyu, that has a bunch of rebellious spirits following him, and there's a cosmic war between good and evil going on, and, you know, you can recognize this is the basic foundation of monotheistic belief. So Zoroastrianism is the first monotheistic religion on earth. And when the Persians take over Babylon, of course, the Jews are exposed to Zoroastrianism, which comes with them. We're not uh, certain if King Cyrus the Great is a committed Zoroastrianism, but he's certainly familiar uh, with this religious idea that there's only one God. And of course, the Jews uh, at this point in time um, have one God that they have tried to serve. And the whole reason that they're in this land is because they were not faithful to just this one God. So Cyrus the Great likes the Jews and issues this decree that they can go back to their land. And so they do. Now, when they get back to their land, things have changed with them. And so we're going to talk about the three big things that have changed here. And these are going to correlate with what you learned in the Axial Age lecture. You might need to review some Axial Age concepts here. Some of you, based on the quizzes I saw recently, might need to review some Axial Age concepts. But this is the Axial Age in Judah. And remember, when we talked about the Axial Age, uh, we talked about major changes, Persia, developing monotheism, Judah moving from henotheism to monotheism, and in India moving from polytheism to monism. All of this was Axial Age uh, era changes. So three things, three categories. Number one, the dualistic concept of good and evil, which I, I just talked about. There's a battle between good and evil going on in the cosmic realms. There's only one good God, and then there's some kind of nemesis, a Satan, someone who's fighting against God uh, with followers that he has managed to deceive who are also fighting against God. So we get the idea of angels and demons fighting each other in the heavenly realms. And when we look at suffering on earth, when we look at injustice on earth, it is always seen in some way as being related to this cosmic battle between good and evil. Somehow this battle is playing out on earth. And so when we see injustice on earth, it is because of the presence of evil that has not yet been completely defeated. Now, there is second aspect of this. And that is that there's going to come a time when this evil is going to be completely defeated. And the time is in the last days or the end times. And there is a term for this, which is the eschaton. And when we talk about eschatological beliefs, these are beliefs uh, regarding the last days. So they're very similar uh, in uh, Second Temple Judaism and Zoroastrianism. And that is the day is going to come when God, by the way, the Zoroastrians call him Ahura Mazda, and their version of Satan is, uh, they usually call him Angra Mainyu, uh, which means the malevolent spirit, or you can actually look at it in Angra Mainyu, the angry mind, and that's exactly what it means. Uh, they also call him Ariman, which means the lie, um, much like in um, Judaism and Christianity and so on, Satan is the father of lies. So similar ideas, and this battle is going on. Um, but the idea is that in the last days in the eschaton, there's going to come a final battle where evil is going to be defeated. And after this, this brings us to our third category here, uh, we have a hope of some kind of restoration. Um, in the beginning, uh, the prevalent hope is that there is going to be some restoration of this earth. Um, and of course, the Jews are very much hoping that God is going to set their kingdom back up with the glory they had in the days of Solomon. And so it's kind of like a this worldly, uh, you know, messianic kingdom or whatever. Um, but as time goes on, we get ideas of like heavenly kingdoms, and the ideas are so many different um, varieties in different uh, religions that have eschatological teachings about who ends up in the spiritual kingdom of heaven and who ends up in the restored kingdom on earth, and whether it's this earth fixed or whether it's destroyed and there's a new earth, and there's all kinds of different ideas uh, that time would fail me to go into. There's another term I want to introduce here, and this is the term apocalypse. Apocalypse comes from the Greek, 
and revelation comes from the Latin. But they both mean an unveiling, a revealing. Uh, you're probably already thinking, that's not the way we use the word apocalypse today, is it? Not at all. You know, if I felt like I'd had some revelation of something, some epiphany on the way to class one night, and I walked in in front of my students and said, wow, I had a real apocalypse on the way here to class, everybody would look at me like I was a little bit crazy. So clearly we don't use apocalypse in the same way now. We've redefined it. Um, but keep in mind that it does mean revelation. In fact, you might know that the last book in the Bible, the Revelation of St. John, uh, in older versions of the Bible, is actually called the Apocalypse of St. John. Anyway, how have we redefined the term apocalypse? Well, it still means a revelation, but it means a revelation of the eschaton. And that's the way I'm always going to use the word when I use it. There obviously are people that could define it or use it in other ways. Um, but clearly, when you think of the apocalypse, you're thinking of the eschaton. You're thinking of the last days. So when you say apocalypse, what you're saying is the revelation of the last days. If you are apocalyptic or you belong to a religious group that is that falls under the term apocalyptic, you believe that you are in the last days or that they're imminent, that you're going into them very soon, that you see the prophetic signs that the last days are coming, that would be apocalyptic. Now, this is common sense. If you're apocalyptic, are you eschatological? Obviously, you must be, right? How can you believe you're in the last days if you don't believe in the last days, right? But if you're eschatological, are you apocalyptic? Maybe, not necessarily. It's possible to believe in the last days that are coming without believing that you're actually in the last days now. So if you don't believe we're in the last days, but you believe they're coming some point off in the future, you are eschatological, but technically we would not term you apocalyptic. Apocalyptic would, would be someone uh, who believes the last days are being revealed now. So let's talk about the three characteristics of apocalyptic communities. I've actually just explained one and alluded to another. The one I explained is the belief that we're in the last days or that the last days are imminent. That means going to come really soon. I also mentioned ancient prophecies, but I'll get to that in just a minute here. Um, number two is because the world's coming to an end, because God's coming back to judge the earth and the faithful ones are going to be rewarded and the wicked ones are going to be destroyed, it's really important to keep separate okay, to keep the chosen people separate from the ones that are destined for uh, some kind of uh, eternal damnation or whatever. Um, so there is a need for separation of the chosen ones from the cursed. And um, so some apocalyptic communities tend to be a lot more sectarian uh, than other communities that are not uh, as apocalyptic. Uh, other monotheistic communities, we're talking about monotheism here, of course, just to narrow our focus. Um, and we talked about this before, early in the course, we talked about sectarianism. And uh, when I talk about different uh, uh, levels or, or degrees of sectarianism, I'm talking about how much the religious community feels like it is necessary for them to stay separate uh, for those that believe very differently than them, for the, from those who are not part of the covenant community. And um, so many people that are very apocalyptic tend to be also kind of ultra sectarian. It's not always the case. Um, but there is some need to be separated. And if you are having some kind of a contact uh, with those who are not saved, it is usually because you're trying to get them saved. You want them to make the decision to join the covenant community and trust God before it's too late. The third characteristic of apocalyptic communities is the one I alluded to previously, and it's an important one. If you're apocalyptic, you believe that the ancient prophecies that are thought to refer to uh, the end times, the judgment of God, the triumph of good over evil, the new world, whatever, resurrection of the dead, these prophecies apply to today. In other words, you are seeing the fulfillment of the ancient prophecies in world events that are transpiring today. You believe that the ancient prophecies have a contemporary interpretation, a contemporary application. So for instance, if you're sitting in your church, and your pastor is saying, you know, what we see today, uh, you know, in the Middle East is the same thing that, you know, Zechariah prophesied here or there. Congratulations, you're apocalyptic. 
you believe that the ancient prophecies, that when the, the prophets saw these visions of the future, they were seeing your time here today. That's apocalyptic thinking. We good? Those are the three main things. So, final cosmic battle is coming. Obviously, uh, light is going to triumph over the darkness. The truth is going to triumph over the lie. God is going to triumph over Satan. The children of light are going to uh, triumph over the rebellious ones. And after this, there's going to be some kind of a restoration to paradise. There's going to be either a new purified earth, an earthly paradise. Um, and over the next few centuries, we get uh, doctrines also of like a spiritual kingdom of heaven, uh, separate from this one that people go to. And as I mentioned before, there are many different varieties of how the idea of heaven, the idea of a purified earth go together in the uh, eschatological interpretations of different monotheistic religions uh, that exist today. Also, another brand new belief is in the resurrection of the dead. Now, let me say one thing here, and, and I've said this kind of thing before. Don't think all of these ideas are fully developed immediately and they all happen at like 1120 on a Thursday. It takes centuries for people to change the way they think about different things. But this is when these ideas are first born. Over the next few centuries, the ideas uh, on the resurrection of the dead, the idea of everybody being resurrected and having some kind of final judgment, the uh, kind of clarifying of the ideas of like heaven and hell, eternal reward or eternal torment, these continue to be developed for centuries. So, but this is when these beliefs begin. So when we see uh, the, the Jews, the Judahites coming back to their land uh, under the Persian Empire, we see that they have embraced all of these different ideas here. Um, and one thing that's interesting is monotheism hasn't existed on earth anywhere before. And here are the Judahites coming home having very, very similar ideas to this monotheistic Zoroastrianism uh, in Persia uh, that they've been exposed to. And this can't just be a coincidence. There's obviously some influence. Now, many scholars think that it's more likely that the Zoroastrians uh, since they had a little bit more time to think about these monotheistic ideas, might have had a little bit more influence on the Jews than vice versa. But there are some conservative Jews and conservative Christians that are kind of offended by that idea. No, it must have been, you know, the Jews that had the greater impact on the Zoroastrians. This is why I have the reverent question mark up there, Persian Zoroastrian influence question mark. There clearly is communication, because here's the first two communities on earth that start to believe these kind of things. Now, as I said before, I don't have time now to uh, talk about all kinds of different apocalyptic and eschatological ideas that exist today. Our first call apocalyptic community that we know about is over 2,100 years ago. It is actually uh, a group that founded a monastic community on the northwest shores of the Dead Sea at a place called Qumran, and they are the ones that are responsible for preserving the Dead Sea Scrolls, you might have heard of, that we started to find in 1948. Anyway, in their writings, we find out that they thought they were in the last days, and they were preparing for a final battle against the armies of evil that was going to usher in this messianic kingdom. So this is the first apocalyptic community we know of that thinks they're in the last days, getting ready to fight the last days uh, battle. And again, this is over 21 hundred years ago that this community was founded. So if you happen to think that we're the first generation that has realized that, oh my gosh, the prophecies are coming true, we're in the last days. Uh, no. <laughs> Over the last couple thousand years, every generation has had those who thought that they were in the last days and thought that they had seen the signs of that assuredly. Maybe we are in the last days. I can't tell you. But all I can say is that in terms of the uh, statistical chances, that we're the first generation uh, to correctly interpret the signs of the times and correctly deduce that we're in the uh, last days, the chances are a bit slim, perhaps. Now, I mentioned this before, but it seems to them that their covenant is over with. When they're being carried into captivity, um, none of the vestiges of the covenant, none of the promises of the covenant, uh, do they still see evidenced. How do you know you're still in covenant you know, with God? Uh, because you still see God's promises manifested in your life, and they're all gone. You know, the God that, uh, you know, is supposed to have given them this promised land, well, they don't have the land anymore. And God was supposed to pick a city 
uh, that you know he would put his name on and you know Jerusalem's destroyed and in the temple his presence was supposed to dwell the temples destroyed the priests are supposed to continually do these rituals to uh, keep them in covenant with God well the priests aren't doing any rituals in that destroyed temple and they're a long way away and of course the promise of protection well they certainly haven't been protected have they um, at least not in any way that they can see so it makes sense to them um, that this covenant is over that God has finally just said uh, you know, you've rebelled one too many times. It's done. It seems God has rejected his covenant people, but the prophets continue to prophesy. And they continue to say that God has not forsaken his people forever. He is chastening them. He's disciplining them, but he's going to restore them to their land. And so now they begin to think very differently about their covenant. And they also start to think very differently about uh, their captivity. They're con being conquered and being taken captive. Um, before, uh, you know, in the henotheistic period, you would think that there are different gods attached to different people. And so if one nation overcame another nation, it would be very common to hear people think that, you know, the one God overcame the other God. Uh, if the children of Israel had been, uh, you know, back in their early days in a battle with the Philistines and they won, they would think, ah, y Yahweh kicked Dagon's butt and vice versa. And, um, and whoever lost would be very demoralized, not just because they lost, but because of the implications of what that says about their God. Either their God wasn't powerful enough to protect them, or either their God was mad at them and wouldn't protect them. But either way, you know, this is the henotheistic way of looking at things. Now, for the first time, they realize God's the only God. And when they went into captivity, uh, it wasn't because, you know, God uh, didn't protect them against other forces. It's because God himself engineered this whole plan uh, to accomplish his will. And he used Babylon for his will. He used Nebuchadnezzar to fulfill his will. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, while God is using him, he kind of falls in the category of someone whose motives aren't right. I mean, God doesn't consider him a righteous man. Um, and God, in fact, is going to punish him and Babylon for their sins. And as we know, the Persians come and destroy them. That's God's punishment. So God is using Nebuchadnezzar, but he is really not a man after God's own heart, so to speak. But Cyrus the Great that comes and destroys Babylon is thought of very, very differently. In fact, in the prophet Isaiah, he is called God's Messiah. Now remember, Mashiach means anointed. And kings, priests, prophets of God, they're all thought to be Mashiach. So there's many messiahs in the history of Judaism. Uh, when you look in the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and you see the word anointed, it's usually some form of the word Mashiach. So Cyrus the Great is actually called a Messiah of God. And he is, by the way, the only one I know of in the Bible that's a non-Israelite, a non-Jew, that is actually called a Messiah um, of the Jewish God. So the Jews love Cyrus. He's a hero. He's sending them back to their land. And the prophet Isaiah is actually saying that God is favoring Cyrus, that God has anointed Cyrus to fulfill his will. This is very different than Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has been used kind of as God's unwitting pawn, and Nebuchadnezzar is going to get his someday. But Cyrus has been raised up by God to do God's will, and he's actually being favored by God, not just used by God. All of this has to do with the idea that there's one God, and he's doing everything. And they start thinking about all the different ways that he's doing things, but it's just one God doing it. This is monotheism, folks. It's the beginning of it in Judaism. True monotheism. One other thing that we have to talk about, and we can move on, and that is that during this period, uh, there is a new form of religious gathering that begins. They're called synagogues. Synagogue is actually a later Greek word. Uh, the Greek empire hasn't taken over yet, but we'll find out. The Greek empire, led by Alexander the Great of Macedonia, is what's gonna finally conquer the Persian empire. And at that point, we're gonna have all kinds of Greek words for everything. Uh, but synagogue is a Greek word that literally means gatherings. Um, doesn't refer to a building. These are gatherings of lay persons. I mean, they're not priests. So what these are are common people. Common people meeting in groups just to study and worship God and pray to God. Of course, for their restoration, they want to go home. And they meet on the Sabbath day. Sunset Friday to sunset Saturday is the Sabbath. Now, they continue to meet in synagogues after they go back to their land. So this is interesting because now you have two different kinds um, of bases of uh, the religion of Judaism. So before it centers on the temple in Jerusalem, the sacrificial system, got the ongoing problem with idolatry. 
We got the prophets speaking out and warning them. But after the Babylonian exile, now God's seen as the only one, you know, transcendent, universal, all powerful. Strict monotheism is embraced. There's no more idolatry. The temple is rebuilt and the priests are going back to work doing their job. So we call this the second temple period here. There's only one temple in Jerusalem. But everywhere that there's a community or township of the Jews or whatever, they're meeting in these groups on the Sabbath called synagogues. And again, these are lay people. These are not priests. So now we have these two bases of the religion. This is going to become very important when the temple is destroyed. Spoiler alert, in 70 CE, um, when the priests lose their power and then the uh, rabbis, who are these elders of the people that have actually uh, gained their reputations, uh, in the synagogue system, teaching the common people how to walk with God every day, they're the ones that end up in control when the priests are finally destroyed. The Tanakh, that's the Hebrew Bible, assumes its final form. We're going to cover this right now. Um, not till now, not till now. Why? Because the only people that really needed to understand uh, the Torah were the priests. Um, and as far as the uh, writings of the prophets, you know, there might have been some different versions of them too. But now that people want all of these uh, writings to use in their synagogue meetings on uh, the Sabbath, everybody needs to be using the same version of things. We're going to talk about the Tanakh right now. Last thing though, the age of the prophets really comes to an end in this first century after they come back from Babylon. Um, after uh, this period, we don't really have any uh, writings from the prophets after that. Um, Christians sometimes call this the intertestamental period. Uh, no Jew would call it that. Because the Christians believe there's another New Testament or New Covenant that comes uh, with Jesus as the author of the New Covenant, kind of like Moses was the mediator of the Old Covenant. So this period of about 400 years from the last prophet until John the Baptist and Jesus show up, um, Christians call the uh, intertestamental period. This 400 years where there's not really any prophets that come with any kind of a message from God that is written down uh, and becomes a sacred scripture. And messianic hopes begin to flourish. What are messianic hopes? Remember, Messiah means an anointed one. We're going to talk a lot about this, so just briefly, there are many prophecies of an anointed one that is going to come and restore uh, the Israelites to the glory they had uh, in the days of Solomon. When we get to the Roman Empire, the Judahites, or the Jews, uh, are quite oppressed, and they are hoping for this anointed person that is going to come and is going to defeat uh, the Romans, and is going to restore them to the glory they had in the days of Solomon. And this person that's going to come uh, is a promised anointed one, a Mashiach. So again, there's many messiahs in, in, in the history of Israel and, and of Judah, uh, but this one specifically is the one that people are hoping for in the time of Jesus when they're feeling so oppressed by the Roman Empire. And we're going to talk about this in detail. Um, but first, we have to uh, talk about the Hebrew Bible, which is the Tanakh. 